Hey guys, on this week's episode, we're going to be reviewing Barry Lyndon. But before that, we'll be talking about Battle at Big Rock, the Jurassic World short film on YouTube. El Camino, a Breaking Bad movie and its three-day theatrical release. Dave Chappelle's Sticks and Stones. And also, Criterion announcements for December 2019. Join us! Welcome to the Casual Cinecast, powered by Cinelinks. My name is Justin, and normally you'd be hearing Chris right now, but Chris cannot make it this week. So with me today, of course, as always, I have a man who, as far as I know, has never lost a duel. Mike, how are you doing? Thank you. That's quite flattering. You're better at this than Chris is, I think. He he would ask me something weird and awkward. Um, I'm doing great. <laughs> Take that, Chris. Yeah. He's not, he's not here to defend himself. That's right. Uh, well, I'm happy to hear you're doing great. And then replacing Chris for today, and if he does a good enough job, maybe forever. Ooh, now look who's being <laughs> Just kidding. Chris. Just kidding, Chris. Don't worry. Uh, we but love it you, is, Chris. <laughs> but joining us is a man who is always on the lookout for a wealthy widow. Peyton, how you doing? I'm doing pretty good. <laughs> wealthy <laughs> widow's good. <laughs> I don't know if that's actually true or not. I assume it's not. I assume it is. Well, I am single now, so who knows if well, there there's go. any wealthy widows out there. Yeah. <laughs> if this is your first time listening to the show, this is a Casually Criterion episode, which is a Criterion Collection-focused episode that we do every other week, where we review a film from, you guessed it, the Criterion Collection, picked by the listeners. Before we get into the main review... We'll be doing our usual news on the march where we talk about recent news and things we've been watching. So if you haven't seen the movie, you can still listen. Then we will be doing a casually criterion review for Barry Lyndon, directed by Stanley Kubrick, spy number 897. That's right. And then at the end of the show, we'll be doing our poll choices for the next casually criterion episode two weeks from now. So listen to the end for those poll choices, and then you can vote on those in our social media which if you want to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, you can follow us at Casual Cinecast. And if you want to send us your questions about the movies we're reviewing each week or topics to discuss, you can send those to Casual Cinecast on any of those accounts, or you can email us at casualcinemedia at gmail.com. And then, of course, if you haven't done so already and you like the show, you enjoy what you hear each week, go onto iTunes, give us a five-star review, let other people know that we're a good show and that they should be listening to us. Please and thank you. All right, guys, are we ready for news on the march? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, yeah. sir. News on the march! All right, Justin, before we get into the Criterion announcements for December 2019, uh, what do you got for us this week? Well, I haven't been watching a lot. Most of my week was dedicated to watching Barry Lyndon, which is a long film. Basically took <laughs> up the whole week. Oh, wow. Did you divide it out like this many minutes a day? Yeah, I watched it eight minutes a day. No, that's not right. That's bad yeah, math. Wait. Yeah, huh? I just said the first number that came to mind, honestly. I didn't try to do division. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. I don't know. But I didn't get to watch a lot this week. But one thing I did watch, which I just threw on really quickly to pass the time while my fiance was cooking dinner was Dave Chappelle's newest stand-up special on Netflix, which is called Sticks and Stones. Wow, where he covers the New Found Glory album. I wish. On stage that, as a one-man show. Yeah, I would have watched that way sooner. <laughs> I would have watched it the day it dropped, not like waited two weeks or however long it's been. <laughs> yeah. uh, but So I put this on just to, like, like I said, pass the time. But I ended up watching the whole thing, and my fiancé got interested in it. And so we ended up watching it while we ate dinner and finished it uh, afterwards. And I got to say, I think Dave Chappelle still has it. I think he's pretty funny. Yeah. Oh, good. I was going to, I was wondering about that. I didn't know how, how it was going to land or not. Cause I've heard, you know, mixed things, but, uh, uh, I guess the more positive than negative, but still, and yeah, he's starting to show his age. I, I, I saw the trailer pop up on Netflix and I just didn't know if it, he was, it was going to be weird or if he still had it, but yeah, it's good to hear that he does. Yeah. yeah. I've also heard mixed things about it. I don't know. I didn't know what to expect. I, I've heard that like the I haven't even looked at this myself, but I heard the Rotten Tomatoes score was like really bad. 
Interesting. But, I mean, yeah, but then, but I also heard like the user score, like the user rating reviews, were really good. So yes, that's that's what I had read too. That it was like it was like thirty five percent of Rotten Tomatoes or something, and then like uh, the audience score was like ninety nine percent or something. It was like so it's like you know critics hated it, but people loved it. So yeah, yeah, I I kind of have a theory on why that is, and that's that in this special, Dave does not like mince words at all and does not like shy away from saying something that might be controversial mm. and yeah. he tackles a lot of subjects that are really hot button issues mm. without shying away from like saying something give us a preview give us a like give us like what's a subject that's a hot button issue that he addresses in this that's that would likely <laughs> make a critic uncomfortable well name a hot button issue and he touched on it really but uh i mean he talks about the me too movement he talks about the michael jackson hbo documentary Uh, he talks uh, about guns and school shootings you know lots of things that uh that get people bent out of shape he talks about comedians that have been uh canceled and the whole cancel culture that's going on and like digging Mm -hmm. up people's past tweets and all of that stuff and uh so i think that like it's so blatant with like him not caring (laughs) That like I feel like a, a critic may be hesitant to give it a positive review. Yeah, it's almost like in this day and age, that's like putting a uh, a target on your social media profile. Yeah, and if your job is to be a critic, like Dave Chappelle is successful, he can say this. This could be his last stand-up special ever because everyone could be like, "I can't believe he said that. That's really yeah. insensitive. Mm-hmm. Let's cancel everything." And he's fine. <laughs> he's well yeah. off, uh, yeah. but a critic may not be. Yeah. 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 It makes sense. I get it. But I mean, I kind of enjoy that type of humor. Like to me, it falls in the same category that Borat or Bruno did that when they came out, that it's just sure. being like intentionally controversial. And, you know, I know not to take that too seriously, I guess, but if you are very easily offended or, yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's things that can offend people, but like overall, like it's done in sort of joke format in a way that like most of it's pretty funny. Like even, you know, my fiance is a school teacher, so school shootings can be a touchy subject for her, but she was laughing throughout his whole school, school shooting bits. So like, they're still done mostly in like good humor. Yeah. No, I mean, that, and that's, I think that's the whole point was, you know, sh- he's trying to show that we can laugh about these things and we can have a sense of humor about it. You don't have to take everything so seriously. And, you know, I guess most people understand that, you know, you, you got it, you know, and, and you just appreciate it. And, and, you know, some people just can't let it go, but no, I think that's, I think it's great when you can still do that. And, you know, maybe that's what the world needed right now. I don't know. I don't know. I I don't think it's going to solve anything. I'll say that much, (laughs) but you know, if you ever watched Chappelle show or liked watching some of the bits of stand up that he would do in between sketches on Chappelle show, like you're really going to like this. So if you'd never liked that stuff, you probably won't like this. So that's kind of my recommendation, but all right, that that's, that's basically it on Dave Chappelle. So Mike, what do you have? All right. So like you, I haven't watched a whole lot of uh, new stuff. I've mostly been rewatching breaking bad and uh, rewatching Dr. Who with my girlfriend because she is currently working her way through that. Hmm. And that has taken up both most of my time basically because that's too TV shows with a lot of episodes, but uh, I did see that they released a um, short film for Jurassic World, directed by Colin Trevorrow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's weird because it actually premiered like on TV, like after a showing of Jurassic World, and then it was released online. And I guess this is going to be like a in between short film to show kind of bridge the gap between the crappy Jurassic world movie that I don't think any of us liked on the show um, (laughs) that came out last year and whatever Jurassic world three is going to be. And this is called battle at big rock. It's like eight minutes. You can watch it on YouTube for free. Um, Yeah. So Peyton, did you watch this short film? I did. Yeah. Okay. What are your, what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, I thought it was, I didn't know what to expect going into it and I was completely engrossed and drawn in. Yeah. Um, you know, no spoilers or anything, but y- you know, I got a little Chris Pratt fatigued, I guess, with the last Jurassic World because I wasn't a fan of it e- either. Uh, yeah. They kind of they kind of went off the rails with it a little bit, and this one feels like more like something I would 
like to watch, which which is sort of sort of like, <laughs> well, dinosaurs are a part of our life, and they're just like you know they're they're you know you have to treat them just like, uh, like a like a bear or you know like a <laughs> right. wild oh, like literally like or like a wild animal or something, and and how does that affect uh you know us? So do we become sensitized to it? How do our kids react to it? I, mean, I thought that was really interesting, and it felt more like it felt like The Walking Dead. But with Jurassic Park elements, so uh, Walking Dead, but with 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 the uh, dinosaurs. So, well, I liked it. I thought it was interesting. It kept my attention. I, I thought I was going to just like zone out uh, in a few minutes, but I was like drawn in and was watching it. So, yeah, Justin, yeah. what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I'm re- pretty much right there with Peyton. I, I think it shows us a world that lots of us have been wanting to see since probably the end of the first Jurassic Park. Where you're like, yeah. I, I want to see dinosaurs in like the real world and stuff and interacting with regular humans. And they, you know, haven't been really giving us that movie. And finally, the one maybe hopeful, enjoyable thing about Fallen Kingdom was that it ends setting up the next movie to be in that world where dinosaurs are just running loose in America. And that's exciting. And so to, to get to see it was was very fun. And the Last thing I'll say about it, it's kind of going off what Peyton said is that he was engrossed by it. But like, I don't know if you guys ever have this, but when I watch like a feature length film, I'll give it a good 20, 25 minutes, maybe 30 before I decide how I feel about it. But if I'm going into a short film, it's got like a minute to hook me, Yeah, you know, which is like a really weird phenomenon. And I'll say that as a short, like this grabbed me from the word go. Yeah, no, no I, I I was smiling so big while you were talking about that because I remember when we were in film school and we would watch a short film and you're like, I already hate it. I don't like the, you know, it's like the font pisses you off. So yeah, I, <laughs> I'm with you there. Yeah. yeah. What did you think, Mike? Well, basically, I think um, this short film is better than anything in either Jurassic World movie that we have so far. Ooh. Like the seven minutes of um, runtime or eight minutes of runtime this thing has is already more thrilling than anything I can think of in Fallen Kingdom, which was directed well, but man, that, that script is a mess. And the in, in what I wanted to kind of jump off of uh, what you were saying earlier, which is you were saying that like you've always wanted to see that, you know, uh, dinosaurs running free in in the wild, you know, that for people to interact with like normal yeah. animals. It's funny, Colin Trevorrow actually said the same thing, that they're, they're actually working towards the Jurassic Park movie that he's always wanted to see. Mm. Mm. and i think that's exactly what is wrong with jurassic world fallen kingdom um (laughs) which is that he was trying to get to this idea and i think he made a crappy movie in the process but (laughs) if jurassic world 3 ends up being this i'm on board i'm saying i'm right there with you if that's if this is part three then i'm on board and you know i I would you know it's starting in in a right direction and I, i would be interested to see more in the franchise but yeah the last one was just I mean, you know, mustache twirling villains that were buying and selling dinosaurs in the basement of a mansion. Yeah, that's just like bananas, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but what I what I fear is going to be the case is that we're going to get more Chris Pratt being heroic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think that's probably true. I, I assume it's not going to be Andre Holland as the main character or this whole family. I'll tell you what, though, this family was more interesting than the main characters we've been getting in the Jurassic World franchise because he's not a, I don't know, masculine, mm-hmm. like, every man hero type guy, you know? Uh, it reminded me of uh, the first Jurassic Park where it's like a bunch of nerds having to fight and a bunch of kids having to fight the dinosaurs. That, that was what was cool, you know? Yeah. yeah. I liked the gag of the car seat being suspended with, like, the uh, Allosaurus head coming in to try and get it, you know? Yeah. That was like perfect staging. Anyway, yeah. cool. I like the little montage at the end also of all like the dinosaurs running wild and causing havoc. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean that's the real teaser thing that like gets me excited, you know, for what this next one could be. Yeah, totally. Same. All right, cool. So that is Battle at Big Rock. Do we have any more thoughts on it before we move on? Nope. No. If you're interested, watch it. It's it's a good good little short film. So yeah, it's yeah, like nine especially... minutes. I don't know if we said how long it was, but only uh, nine minutes. So super that's like, easy. Yeah, that's two minutes longer than I guesstimated, but still really easy considering it's free. And you know, if uh, the last Jurassic Park movie turned you off, which or Jurassic World, excuse me, then give this a shot. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about, guys, was uh, a little bit of news, and that is that El Camino, a Breaking Bad movie. 
We talked about that a couple weeks ago. The trailer dropped. Um, well, it now has a update. It still comes out on October 11th, but it's getting a three-day theatrical release window in selected movie theaters. Oh. Ooh. Yeah. So you can actually, maybe in your hometown, go see Jesse Pinkman do whatever this movie is going to be about on the big screen. Yeah, it's playing at the Alamo Draft House near me. They just announced the screening. That's pretty cool. Does this make you more or less excited? Do you think – I don't know. What do you guys think about this? You, would you watch more um, simultaneous Netflix releases with, like, limited theatrical windows like this? Mm, yes, probably, if it piqued my interest. Like, I know, you know, like, uh, Dolomite is my name. Uh, the new Eddie Murphy movie is uh, mm-hmm. is doing the same thing. It's, it's a Netflix movie, but I think it's going to have the same. It's going to be playing for a couple of days, may, you know, three, four days days in the theater and that's something that that if it does come around here i'm certainly gonna go see it man i can't wait to see that yeah it looks so great and uh so yeah i think i I, if they kept this up i I think uh i think that's really important i think that's culturally important too um you know because like i remember like you know the Cannes film festival like they hate netflix they're not allowed to show netflix movies there anymore because they said that they're they're killing the you know people getting out and going to the movies and uh going to restaurants and killing culture and they just want people to like sit uh, you know in their couch and just like veg out and stuff so no i think that's a step in the right direction and i, and I would do it yeah if, if the movie's good enough i'll do it for the irishman too if it happens to do that yeah i actually saw the breaking bad finale in an angelica film center in dallas uh that was pretty cool yeah, it was a lot of fun. So I might do this if it comes around me. I will definitely. I don't know. It's it's like a uh, community experience of everyone who's excited for this one thing. But then again, it's also going to be on Netflix the same day. It seems like so. <laughs> you know, maybe I'll want to watch it at four in the morning instead. <laughs> yeah, it just depends on my schedule and what time I have. It also depends. Uh, my fiance is the bigger Breaking Bad fan between the two of us, so I could very easily see a scenario where she really wants to go see this one in theaters. In which case, I will do it because that's what you do when you're engaged. Mm-hmm. And you got to take one for the team sometimes. Does she watch Better Call Saul? No, I don't think so. I don't. Uh, Dude, she hasn't seen it yet, as far as I know. But we we both want to watch it for sure. If she is at all a Breaking Bad fan, she needs to watch Better Call Saul for sure. Well, I, I know a couple people have said that you know they actually think it's better when it, when the when the series got going. Better Call Saul yeah. was was better than Breaking Bad, so I, I haven't say, watched it either. Yeah. Once you get to season two onward, I would say that's probably true of Better Call Saul. I know Chris would back me up and you up, Peyton, if he were here. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. All right, neat. So that is the El Camino Breaking Bad, a Breaking Bad movie, getting a three-day theatrical release, October 11th through 13th. Check your local cinema. <laughs> okay, guys, we're nearing the end of the News on the March How about we discuss the Criterion release announcements for December of 2019? Yeah, let's do it. Peyton, why don't you read those off? Okay, yeah. So uh, Criterion uh, released uh, their announcements for the December 2019 uh, films. They are uh, in this order. The Story of Temple Drake, directed by Stephen Roberts. Tunes of Glory, directed by Ronald Neem. Neemy? Neem? I think it's Ronald Neem. Uh Uh, Until the End of the World by Vim Vendors, and Old Joy by Kelly Reichardt. Wonderful, yeah. yeah. So I have seen zero of these movies. What about you guys? Yeah, I've seen Old Joy. I've seen Old Joy. uh, I think I've seen Tunes of Glory. It's been a really long time, and I I haven't seen... Until the end of the world, the long one. I know that's like a five-hour miniseries, but uh, but it was a two-hour, got truncated like a two-hour theatrical run when it came out. I've seen that. It's not very good. But I've heard the five-hour miniseries is like unbelievably great. Yeah. Nice. It seems like it would be hard to edit down five hours into two hours. But <laughs> Yeah, you'll, you'll lose a lot, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, Old Joy's one I've been wanting to see forever. Uh, being Kelly Reichardt, who I, you know, I really love Wendy and Lucy and just have wanted to check out more stuff uh, since that one. And Old Joy is obviously like her her other most famous one that I can think of. Yeah. When I watched Wendy and Lucy, I went back and watched Old Joy that was, I think it was on Netflix at the time. And then um, that was around the time Meek's Cutoff was coming out as well. So yeah. Anyway, Old Joy is really good. I liked it. 
Yeah, I think the first one I saw was Mick's Cutoff. That's how I, you know, I kind of that was the 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 gateway into that. And then, you know, Wendy and Lucy was amazing. So that's why I sought out Old Joy. So, all right. Anybody got anything else to say about any of these other films? Story of Temple Drake, I've never heard of. Nope, nothing to say. All right. Well, I am very excited about Until the End of the World. I do think that has fantastic artwork and. Yeah. I like everything I've seen by Wim Wenders so far. So, have I'm you seen um, Wings of Desire? I have seen Wings of Desire. Yeah, I saw that in a movie theater. Oh wow! Oh really? Yeah, it was pretty good. It was good. It was fun though. Yeah, I saw it on Turner Classic Movies one night. Nice. I uh, we, you know we were talking about it a little bit before before the show started, but uh, like I've I've heard of the you know until the end of the world is how i even heard about it was through uh a criterion forum that i found that i joined like it was either 2011 or 2012 and even back then people were going like when are y'all going to release this this is like right up your alley and you guys could like make a beautiful restoration of it and you know actually you know resurrect the the long cut so i'm excited to see it on the basis of that because as far as i know the only way you could get the long cut was like you know just getting sort of like, you know, region C DVD or something from Germany. Oh, wow. And it's, and, and it's like a, you know, VHS scan or something like it's still in like four by three. So it's, you know, this is going to be like seeing it like a whole new movie. So, yeah, well, Criterion can do wonders with stuff like that. So I'm sure it'll be awesome. Hopefully they have a special feature showing all the restoration process that they did to, to make it look however it is when they release it. Cause that's always fun. Yeah. They tend to do it with things that are really damaged. And stuff. I would too. So I don't know if I don't it's know how damaged rights. this one is. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. But I do wish, like, generally, it would be cool to see a whole lot more restoration stuff because that does interest me too. Yeah. All right, guys. Um, I think that pretty much exhausts the news on the march this week. What do mm-hmm. you say we move into our casually Criterion review for Stanley Kubrick's Barry Lyndon? Let's go. Yeah, I can't wait. Mark this, and come what will of it. I will fight the man who pretends the hand of Nora Brady. I'll follow him if it's into the church. I'll have his blood, or he'll have mine. All right, so as always with our Criterion films that we review, most of them are older, so you should have seen them by now. So we do not do a spoiler-free general thoughts section on these films. So we're going to go straight into spoilers, starting at the end of this alert, which is right now. And now you've passed the alert. That was it. You're there. Okay, so guys, um, I'm going to go ahead and kick us off on Barry Lyndon because I chose this movie in the poll, and the audience chose it with me. Okay. And so I won. Congratulations! Yes, yeah, it's, it's my victory. Is that what you're? Is that what you're fishing for here? <laughs> yep. Thank you. <laughs> Some pats on the back. Yep. Yeah. Congratulations! It was a. It was an awesome pick. I. I love this movie. Thank you, Peyton. Okay, so this was the main Kubrick movie that I had still not seen. Hmm. Yeah, I'm pretty sure the only other thing I'm missing from Kubrick's filmography is Spartacus. Hmm. Hmm. I'm I'm fairly certain. Anyways, so I chose this movie for the poll because I basically just wanted an excuse to see it. It's very long, and so it's hard to squeeze in on like a casual, like, hey, what do you want to watch tonight, you know? Yeah, totally. So uh, I really enjoyed it. I watched it two nights ago, so I'm still kind of turning it over in my head. Obviously, you can't not bring up how great this movie looks. Mm-hmm. The, the composition of the shots... The natural light, the elaborate zooms, all of it's great. I'm sure we'll talk more about that stuff in uh, more specifics later on. But anyways, I was never once bored. Uh, I love the music and the editing. I think as far as editing goes, this is my favorite Kubrick, uh, maybe other than 2001. I think uh, this movie is just a lot of fun. Barry himself, like as a main character, was interesting. And I would say it feels more interesting than I thought it would based on Kubrick's other filmographies, right? This was very toned down and uh, in subject matter. I think it's actually rated PG, isn't it? Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah. Which uh, I, I didn't really know that, I guess, before starting to watch it, right? So I didn't really know what I was going to be in for at all. What is 2001 rated? I think, I think that that's rated G. Like P- G. 
So. Yeah, I think 2001's even G. I think those are the only two movies, though. Maybe Spartacus, because it was like made in the 60s. But usually he even is controversial in a subject matter. Yeah, or at least definitely. dark, you know? So this movie's definitely dark, but it's a lot more interesting than I thought it would be. And um, it's a side of Kubrick that is under-celebrated, I think. I think this movie is under-talked about. Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, if it was talked about more, you would have seen it by now. And then I think... That goes for me too, because this is my second time to to have seen it, but both times that I've watched it have been for a podcast. You know, it kind of took a little nudging to get me there, but then I think it's because it's just, you know, not as celebrated. Yeah. And that's coming from two guys who like Kubrick, right? Like who, you know, yeah. went through a Kubrick phase of watching all his movies, but for some reason we stopped short <laughs> at this one. <laughs> we, we even watched a documentary about the life in, of Kubrick, which I think is called Kubrick, A Life in Pictures. But we watched the documentary, and not and not this movie. Yeah. So anyway, Justin, go ahead and go into your thoughts real quick. What what do you think about Barry Lyndon? Sure. So like I said, it was my second time to watch it. This time was more enjoyable than the first. And as I think Roger Ebert and probably other people have said, you know, the the good movies get better on repeat viewings and the bad ones get worse. So definitively, because it got better, we can say this is a good movie. I think. Woo. Is that fair? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He dodged um, a bullet there, yeah. Right. <laughs> so I, I think it's, like you said, the cinematography may be the best cinematography of all time, like really high up there. It's so good. Uh, the characters I, I find very interesting because I learn a lot from them by their actions as opposed to like looking at them and watching them perform. <laughs> yeah, As right. opposed to like, I don't see their emotions coming to the forefront a lot at least at least not like the main character of barry linden and maybe uh lady linden his wife later on in the film mm -hmm. they they just seem the performances seem so like dry that i i just find it interesting to learn about a character that is like kind of hard to read at times all through their actions which i think is one of the things that keeps the movie very interesting yeah the the other thing that i don't hear talked about too too often that i found on my first viewing and definitely on this one is I think the film is actually pretty darn funny. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's something I never expected going into it the first time. I didn't know if the second time it would be as funny, but I think it, it holds up like to me, it's funny and enjoyable to watch in a very similar way to like the way that I feel when I saw there will be blood for the first and second time. Yeah. I was about to say, this reminds me, probably the most of a P.T. Anderson movie. Like, I know P.T. Anderson gets compared to Kubrick a lot, but this is the film that I felt it more than even in There Will Be Blood. Like, Or, excuse me, uh, more than, like, um, The Shining or some of the more um, popular Kubrick movies that P.T. Anderson gets kind of cited for. Mm -hmm. This definitely, I felt it here more than anything. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I find it to be just this kind of, even though it's slow paced and kind of long and technically speaking, that doesn't feel long, but like it's this kind of weirdly funny comedy of manners almost where I find myself laughing at just the way that like Barry Lyndon carries himself sometime or the way that other people are dressed. And I, I feel like I'm laughing with the film in those moments of just like some of the ridiculous and over the top of like over the top qualities of like these aristocratic people <laughs> who are like high society in these days. It's just kind of funny. I, I debate whether or not the film's a comedy or a drama. Maybe we can debate that later. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's, so that's that's where I'm at. I really enjoy the film. Uh, I'm sure it'll get better with subsequent viewings. Right now I'm kind of at a four and a half out of five is where I land on the film. Not quite like perfect because it's not just, just doesn't feel right to call it a perfect movie for some reason for me, but I did really enjoy it. So Peyton... What do you think about Barry Lyndon? Uh, well, I was excited when you, you know, when you had asked me to to get on this one, this one because I really like this movie a lot. I, in fact, I think it's probably my favorite Kubrick film. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is. I I, I rewatched it. I think it's like maybe the fourth or fifth time I've seen it. Um, it's really unique. I, I agree with you in all, all points. I mean, it's it's amazing to look at, and it, and it's got this like hypnotic quality. Uh, you just get drawn in and sucked in. Like it's really hard to, to look away and it's really hard to turn off just because it's like these things are going and it's got this really um, languid pace, but it just draws you in. And 
in watching it again, it's, you know, like, like you, I, you know, it got better. And, you know, I just started noticing other different things, very similar to what you did, which is you can't really single out a really good performance. It's not like this movie was geared for performances. There's no memorable dialogue. Uh, it's just sort of like, yeah, people are doing things and you understand their actions. There's, you know, this great, great scene uh, in the film where, uh, you know, Barry Lyndon's like wooing a woman and it seems to go on forever. And it's just like this really, you know, the, the amazing music, really well shot, really well edited of just like Barry Lyndon wooing her. And it's like completely wordless. <laughs> uh, but that music. Yeah, that's what does it. It's like all there. So it's 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 unique in that it's like the the what, you know, Hitchcock would talk about, you know, his dream was to be able to make a movie with no dialogue, and that's kind of what this movie is. It's the 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 shots, the actions as well as the music. It's it's a complete movie. It's all the things that we do uh for movies in order to get an effect and it's working and it's doing its job perfectly. So uh, if there was one thing that I would say that like stand out as far as like my favorite performer or actor in the movie, it was uh, Barry Lyndon's wife. Um, she more than any uh, anybody else, like with with very little effort, uh, you know, just exuded like melancholy and sadness and and all that stuff. So I, mean, th I think that was really great. But um, but yeah, I, I mean, and you, I, I won't belay, beleaguer anything more because you kind of talked about the cinematography and the costumes and everything else. But um, yeah, absolutely breathtaking to, to watch and amazing zooms. And yeah, it's great. And, I, and I'm with you every time I watch it. I, I find it funnier and funnier. Yeah. <laughs> like just, just like just ma mainly just in the way people react to things like, you know, you're riding in the wrong direction. Oh, am I? You know, it's just like this. It's, yeah, it's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting, Justin, that you were talking about how you have to kind of feel characters out through their actions more than anything else. And I, that's actually really interesting because I didn't really know what this movie was going to be about. I didn't know what kind of character Barry Lyndon was going to be. And I guess like 30 minutes into the movie, I was like, man, I guess he's just a crappy guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you know, like yeah. he didn't seem like it at the beginning, right? He seemed like maybe like a hothead, you know, and then you just get enough things of like pros and a cons column, right? And you have like en enough tallies and like the, he just keeps doing crappy things <laughs> column where it's like, he seems like a nice guy, but also we're not let into his head enough to really know who he is, you know? So right. he just keeps doing one crappy thing after another. And eventually you're just like before, like somewhere 30, 40 minutes into the movie, I was just like, I cannot wait for this guy's downfall, <laughs> y you know? But yeah. I'm enjoying watching him get there and and I can't wait for the next crappy thing he's going to do or the next selfish thing he's going to do. But, you know, sometimes he'll turn around and do something really heroic as well. Yeah, like like what uh, per se? Well, um I guess you could be I guess you could argue that it was for selfish reasons, but um saving the captain from the Prussian army who captured him. Uh, who oh, captured right. him for being a deserter from the English army. That guy basically had no reason to like Barry at that point, or um, Redmond Barry, excuse me. But he saved him anyway from a burning building and then, you know, collected himself one more father figure, mm -hmm. basically, right. in like the long line of father figures. So, you know, maybe he came to respect the guy and that's why he did it, or maybe he thought if he did ingratiate himself with this guy, it would provide him another reason to escape. I don't know, but um, that was one of like the two or three moments in the movie where I really felt for Barry and wondered if there were some redeeming qualities within this guy. Yeah, so I, I find it interesting that you feel that way because I I think I felt that way the first time was I was looking for these moments to like feel for this character, and on a second viewing, or really by the end of your first viewing, you realize like well all along he's been pretty self serving like he's not doing anything unless he thinks there's an advantage to be gained for himself right. out of it. And so watching it the second time, I'm curious whenever you do watch it, if you'll feel this way, but like, I, I just never, those moments don't come to me anymore. I'm like, Oh, you might be a nice guy. This is kind of nice. <laughs> and I guess that's why I wanted to know what you thought, because watching it this time, mm -hmm. I was like, he's just being self-serving, just yeah. being opportunistic <laughs> this whole time. You know, and the, the scene that comes to mind when I, when I, and the, pretty much the only time I'm just kind of like, uh, feeling sympathetic towards 
Barry Lyndon or uh, or I guess yeah he was Redmond Barry still then but uh, but was it was when he was supposed to go and spy on the uh, the gambler guy the con artist uh, and, yeah and well he couldn't bring himself to do it and you know and we hear through the, you know there's oh that's something we we haven't really talked about but like you know the 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 backbone of this whole movie and really it's a performance in and of itself is the narrator this like yeah. dry British voice that that kind of propels the uh, the narrative but. Um, you know, the, 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 uh, narrator says something like, you know, uh, knowing that he was, he was sitting in a room with somebody who was also, uh, Irish, you know, it brought him to tears and he confessed everything to him and everything like that. So, but I, but I was like, I, you know, that I can kind of feel for him there. I mean, I, I put myself in the position of like being an American. What if you were just like dropped in the middle of a foreign country and you never hear anybody speak English ever. And all of a sudden you're with a, another person who's from America. Yeah. You're probably going to have like a little bit of like homesickness come back. So yeah. uh, like that was the one point I was just like, Oh, I kind of feel for that guy. Cause I could, I could put myself in that, in that position. Uh, but that fades quickly because <laughs> he's a kind of an asshole. Yeah. Right. And I do want to talk about, the narrator if you guys don't have any more at the moment on Barry Lyndon as a character. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Yeah. What I find really interesting about the narrator is that he does propel the story forward, but at the same time he keeps the the movie from having a traditional narrative, at least in terms of suspense or I can't wait to find out what happens next. I mean a combination of the narrator narrator and like the title card, I believe it's like after the intermission that's like this is the the unfortunate happenings or whatever it is. I don't remember the wording exactly, but this, the unfortunate happenings and the downfall of Barry Lyndon and throughout the movie, the narrator is telling us like what's about to happen in scenes or, or like what Barry's plan is. And I just find that very cool, like and confident of a move of like, I'm so confident in like my film and its ability to suck you in and entertain you that I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. I don't need the suspense of not knowing how this thing's going to end. I, I like that. Yeah. Well, and and w- what I think it does also, I think it's it's not only the narration, but also the uh, you know whoever the actor was who actually did that reading. It l- leaves the viewer feeling very um, like at arm's length from everything that's going on. It's like a wall of emotion that, that keeps you away from actually getting too close to them. It's more like it's very sterile. It's like you're just kind of hanging back and just sort of watching these things happen. And it's, it provides this disconnect, which also adds into their performances and everything else. So uh, that's, that's, I really like that too. And I think that disconnect too, just it does tie in a little bit with the way that it's shot and how everything looks like a painting or you're, it's very, very much feels like almost like there's a frame that we can't see on the edge of a lot of the scenes. Right. And so it's like your look, which I mean, I guess there technically is if we're watching it on a TV or whatever, but I don't know. It just, it gives this feeling of observation as opposed to interaction emotionally. Yes. That's perfect word. You're, you're literally an observer, like just watching these things happen from afar. Yeah. Right, and then obviously, um, I think it's pretty much famous for this movie that if you know anything about the way this movie is shot, you know that Kubrick took a lot of inspiration from 18th century paintings, uh, as well as edited to and um, listened to lots of 17th and 18th century music to try and get that feel right. But in regards to the narration, I think, you know, um, earlier one of you mentioned how there's not really any memorable dialogue or any character moments or anything like that. Well, not maybe not character moments, but there's no memorable dialogue or anything like that in Barry Lyndon. And I think the narration has a lot to do with that because every little bit that we get into Barry's character and what he's thinking are entirely through his actions and that narrator. Like Barry never talks about his feelings with anybody really. No, no, (laughs) nobody talks about much. And another slight bit of evidence that I find of, Kubrick being aware that the dialogue isn't that important or memorable or matters is that we never subtitle any of the foreign language that's being spoken. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Even even if you can't, you know, sometimes in movies they'll do that and you can infer what's being said by reactions and other stuff. But there's several times in this movie where there's no ability to infer what's being said. We're just hearing German (laughs) or French or whatever. And he just doesn't bother subtitling it dialogue is not that important in this movie 
Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Man, so I was looking at this uh, featurette on like basically how they filmed a lot of the scenes in this movie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And a lot of those like candlelit scenes, you know, how um, Kubrick, you know, designed his own camera lens basically, or got two camera lenses that weren't compatible, or basically got a camera lens that wasn't compatible with his camera, and he basically got it mounted on there. And especially specifically for this movie and created some kind of um, specific aperture adjuster that you could adjust on the fly as you're filming. And all of that to say that those candlelit scenes are actually really, really impressive. But man, pulling focus for this movie must have been a nightmare. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's like not even there. <laughs> yeah, like the shallow is... Or excuse me. The, uh, the focus is so shallow in some of these um, scenes that like... The shot is framed, and not even everyone who's in the shot like can be in focus. It's not even possible. No, I noticed that there was that uh, the scene where I think it was right before Barry Lyndon got arrested. You know, he'd been impersonating an officer or something. But yeah, I was like, there's, I was like, nothing's in focus. Like, you know, and they couldn't. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure it was like we're we're, we're about as about as good as we can get. So yeah, the the candlelit scenes where they're, I assume they're using that super wide open aperture lens, tend to be like even at its sharpest. Uh, point it seems still seems to be a little bit soft to me at least in and co- definitely in comparison to like the outdoor scenes which are tend to be super crisp or other like daytime scene and scenes inside um so yeah there's definitely it, it's cool that he did it but i think some of those scenes to me stand out as just being like a little bit too soft for my liking like they're, they're kind of distracting to me Mm-hmm. Yeah, that same. Yeah, it was it was distracting. Yeah, because I was like, is his ear in focus? I don't what what you know. Yeah, so that, that's just me. <laughs> I think that's just us. So yeah, it might be a film like school filmmaker people who have dealt with lenses and stuff sort of thing. Well, it's more like interesting watching them from like a um, historical perspective, right? Because you know, like all the work that went into like making this stuff and like the you know like the lenses were originally used for like I think satellites or something like that, like satellite cameras. <laughs> And they're wow. supposed to be used for like space, <laughs> like NASA lenses or something like that. So like, uh, it's all you know out there. You can look all this stuff up. But basically, Kubrick bent over backwards to try and get a special camera to do this uh, and open up the aperture wide enough to get these candlelit scenes. That yeah, they're the worst looking thing in the movie. But also, um, knowing all the history and effort that went into them they're interesting to watch from that perspective. You know, it's kind of like watching yeah. a Buster Keaton stunt or something like that, you know, mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah. There's, there's a lot more context that goes with it. <laughs> was the featurette that you watched, was that the one with the gaffer and the f- focus puller for the film? Yeah. There, yeah. I was going to say, if anyone has the criterion edition or doesn't have it yet, like to me, it's worth getting for that special feature alone alongside the film, of course, is there's just this long featurette with them. I think it's like 15, 20 minutes the full version that's on the, on the edition. And like, it's just fascinating to hear them talk about it and talk about having to keep focus on some of those long zoom outs and like the outdoor scenes. And that Kubrick was really, really meticulous with those zooms. You know, if you've ever zoomed out on a zoom lens, there's points in there where like between your starting point and your ending point where like the, the frame's not going to look as good because the zoom lens doesn't often zoom like perfectly out. It'll mess with your composition but he insisted that they adjust camera while zooming to ensure perfect composition if you paused that zoom at any point. And I, that's, like, insanely meticulous to me. Yeah. In fact, um, between this and 2001 A Space Odyssey, I could watch probably just hours of um, watching Kubrick be meticulous and planning out how to film things. Yeah. Because it seems like he always really um, dreamed big and oh, ahead definitely. of his time. You know, and I actually um, have seen this quote from him, which basically just saying that, like, whenever writing a script, he never really thinks about the logistics of how to film it. He always because that would like, you know, alter what he uh, wrote. Right. So he wanted to, you know, write whatever he was going to write and then focus on the issue of how do you film it? And that explains how you get things like in 2001 A Space Odyssey, the space station. Or you know, the candlelit scenes like this, you know, in Barry Lyndon. I'm glad you brought up the Criterion Extras because, you know, I've, I had, I think I had the old Warner's Blu-ray um, and uh, Criterion does a great job and this movie looks amazing. It's not 
like miles better than the old Blu-ray that was out. But if you're going to buy this, it's, it's worth the cost just to get the, uh, all those behind the scenes and all those feature There's was a wonderful, um, uh, interview with Leon Vitale who played Lord Bullington, um, who was just like amazing in the movie, but little, little known fact about him. He, uh, after he left, uh, or finished filming Barry Lyndon, he started working for Kubrick as his personal assistant and was with him up until he died and was just his, <laughs> his, his guy. And there's an amazing movie on Netflix. Uh, you know, for anybody listening, w- wants to watch it. It's, uh, it's called film worker. And Leon Vitale talks in like excruciating detail about what it was like to work on, uh, Barry Lyndon and work under Stanley Kubrick and get so uh, like, you know, like immersed in working with him and how meticulous he was. He was like, I don't ever want to work with anybody else but you. And so he just like quit being an actor and just started working for him. Interesting. Yeah. I've heard about that film. There's been, I don't know, two, three, four people that I've met within the last year that have recommended film worker to me. So you're kind of another person now. And I think with, was it earlier this year that 2001 came out and we went and saw it or was that there's the end of last year? Uh, I think that was this year. No, it was the end of, it was like October ish of, they re-released it. So it was almost a year ago. Yeah. But between watching that and watching Barry Lyndon again, now I feel like I really need to go watch film worker. Mm -hmm. You should. It's, it's an hour and a half. It's not too long. Um, it was shot by like, you know, and this is just, that's just us. I think it was shot by somebody who didn't know how to use a camera, but the content was amazing. <laughs> so it doesn't look good. It's not a, it, it, in that way, but it's compelling just to hear Leon Vitale talk about what it was like and how, you know, like Kubrick refused to use stand-ins or, uh, or, um, or anything like that. So if we were going to block out a scene or if I'm going to light him, he wanted the actors to stand there. And he talked about how, uh, Ryan O'Neill was like being like, I guess kind of mad about it. It's like, why don't we just get a stand in? And Kubrick was like, you know, I'm paying you like whatever million dollars. You're going to stand where I tell you to stand for as long as I tell you to stand there. So. <laughs> yeah. I saw that too. Like, um, the interview where I think Ryan O'Neill who plays Barry was, um, talking about how he didn't want to use stand ins. And oftentimes he didn't plan out his shots ahead of time. So like once he got the first shot of the day down, the rest of the shots would kind of fall in place. But a lot of times he would agonize for sometimes hours over that first shot of like what the first shot was going to be of the day. And meanwhile, the actors are just standing around in costume, like bored and wasting time. So (laughs) that's something that would never fly today. No, only for a few directors who've already established themselves. I don't know that any new director could come up and do that. No, I don't think so either. And this, this film had, I think I saw somewhere it was a 300 day shooting schedule. Wow. And that's, that's why. <laughs> yeah. It's like he planned in advance. He's like, I don't know what I'm doing yet. Give me time. And I will say that, you know, earlier I was talking about the narrator taking away a lot of suspense. I do want to talk about the final duel scene with the son and Barry Lyndon because that thing is like Sergio Leone levels of suspenseful and slow paced. Yes. I'm so glad you brought that up. Yeah. It's, it's, that is like you edge of your seat and it's a combination of the music and everything else. Yeah. It, it is absolutely that. Yeah. That was actually, um, I alluded to earlier, one of the couple times I actually almost felt for Barry a little bit, but then again, you can also take a step back and, realize that maybe any selfless action on the surface is probably just a, an action that would make him look better Mm -hmm. and serve him Mm -hmm. in the long run. Like I was thinking he was expecting Bullington to uh, give up if he shot his gun on the ground, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. To get to be like, I have received my satisfaction now that we've dueled. Right. I think he was really banking on that, but I don't know. What do you guys think? Do you think Barry really didn't want to kill Bullington or do you think that um, it was just a, last ditch gamble to you know not get shot Ooh, like last last final act of a coward kind of thing yeah just being like oh look i'm being the mature one here no i thought i i i always construed it as he looked at him and was actually like you know i've i i know what you're feeling because i was you and mm-hmm. you know that's he was like seeing himself again and that's what i honestly thought he's like you know what i'm i'm gonna give you the yeah i'm gonna do you something that wasn't done for me so i'm just gonna do this and yeah Yeah. See, that's how I initially read it, but our conversation so far has made me kind of rethink it. What do you, what do you think, Justin? Yeah. I mean, I read it as, you know, the opportunity for the duel to be over is after that. And 
I don't think Barry's in a place where he really feels actual anger to like want to kill him. And I don't see that he can see any like opportunity to, you know, better his own position by killing him, like by actually just shooting him. Like, and I think he fully expects duel to be over afterwards. I think he maybe even remembers like what happened to him after his first duel where he shot that guy where he had to go run and hide away for a while. I don't know that he's too worried about that this time, but I do think that there may be like, uh, he's thinking other negative repercussions, like his whole wife thing, because he never takes care of his situation at home where, where he can control the finances, right? Like it's still under the control of the widow. She still has to sign off on everything, even though he's advised to like take care of that stuff and get it to where he can have access and like say over the fortune. He never does that. So I feel like he's thinking if I kill her son in this duel, yeah, that I'm is never going to get that. And maybe our whole relationship is over. So I find those sort of reasonings to be more likely than Barry just feels sympathy for him. Mm-hmm. So yeah. that's my theory. Yeah. So I've got opposite ends of the uh, spectrum here on that. So <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm still confused, but I guess that's the, in- that's the intention, you know? Mm-hmm. I wanted to mention, you know, um, the end, and you said that Barry saw himself in Lord Bullington. I think that's really obvious, right? There's a lot of parallels and a lot of mirrors in the second half of the movie to the first half of the movie. Mm -hmm. Um, I think one of those things is the way zooms are used is completely different in the second half of the movie versus the first half of the movie. In the first half of the movie, like the zooms are always zooming out to always be unveiling more. There's always more, you know what I mean? Like just when you think we're done zooming out, oh my gosh, there's more <laughs> lush fields in the background. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like it just like England and Ireland where this is filmed, they're just completely gorgeous. And the second half of the movie, the zooms are very much like either zooming inwards to um, show you less and less, or they're zooming out, but like indoors. Right. Um, so it's like not showing you more and more. It's like showing you like walls and, and like things closing Confinement. in on him. Yeah. So, um, I thought that was actually really interesting that the movie's always pushing the limits and like the zooms and the cinematography and making everything look like a painting. But in the second half, it's very, um, very different feel. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a good call. I never paid that like meticulous attention to the zooms and the direction of them. So that's absolutely something I'm going to look forward to on like the third one. But I, if I'm thinking back, like uh, I'm trying to remember second half zoom outs and I don't really have anything. So I think you're um, right. Yeah. The, um, the, the main zoom out that comes to mind is there's one where he's like in a brothel and he's got a couple like ladies that he's like oh, right. all over, you know, that are all over him mm-hmm. and it kind of zooms out there, but usually it's like a zoom in or it's like very much like, um, you could see the walls and you can see like light pouring in through windows, but it's usually like in very dark rooms and um, yeah. And then some zoom, zoom, zoom ins indoors as well. But I thought that was kind of interesting. And then the last shot you actually see Barry um, is a zoom in of him getting into like a carriage mm-hmm. and it's zooming in and zooming in and zooming in. And then it's kind of freeze frames. Um, so it's like his world is kind of closing in the last time you see him. Interesting. No, I did. I didn't. Uh, I didn't. I guess I noticed it, but my, you know, my, my brain did. I didn't notice it, but my brain did. So yeah, uh, yeah I'll have to look for that again. Yeah, I think maybe exaggerating the idea that everything he's accomplished has gone away. He doesn't have a leg. He's probably not going to do much more with his life, and so he's getting into a bit of a metaphorical coffin in that that sort of stagecoach. Mm-hmm. So I think just. The zoom in makes sense. And so regarding Barry's character, you know, he collected a lot of father figures. I kind of mentioned that earlier. He's got dad issues since his dad died in a duel, which I guess is why he's so reckless and quick to duel as a young man. And um, also probably why he's so um, ambitious to gain status in the world, right? Because his dad kind of let his family down. So it seemed like he really enjoyed being a father. And I think Mm -hmm. his son, I think his name was Brian. Do you think that that might have been the only person in the movie that he genuinely cared for? Yes. I Yeah, I think so. Yeah, definitely agree. Do you think he would have been a different guy had his first love, his his cousin, I can't remember her name, 
returned his affection or do you think his nature eventually would have kind of won out and he would have been a kind of a vagabond eventually anyway um, and i always took that as like that was the big turn for him like he could you know stay and you know he, he was yeah he was he was already kind of on the edge there but it's it's you know just marry this girl have a nice little farm and that's going to be me and i you know live this simple easy little life or you know the other side was you know let your ambitions take hold so uh, because i think even his it's i don't know if it's explicitly stated but it's certainly implied i felt was that the mom was very much like you're amazing and you're wonderful and you can do all these things and you're the most clever and you know uh (laughs) you have all these things yeah typical mom so i think you know but but, you know him wanting to be with that girl was when he was young was like his rebellion against that he was like no no i think i kind of want this the simple life but uh so yeah, that's what I think. I think if he had, st- that would have been a completely different story, and he would have just, you know, stuck with yeah. just being simple. Right, and if you look at his relationships, I guess really the two relationships he has with women, after that point, he doesn't really seem to care. Like he obviously with the widow, he's getting into it to be wealthy and marry this this rich widow, but even the German farm girl whose husband is away in the army. Even when he stays with her, he's looking for food. He has this relationship with her uh, that's implied, I think. uh, And then he just leaves without like really seeming to like hung up about having to leave. It's not like he doesn't want to go. Right. He's, He's not trying to convince her to like, yeah. Let's let's go away together. Like he's it's he. I think he's just using her at that point too. Oh, I agree that he's using her. But do you think that that callousness comes from being burned before, you know, by his first love, or do you think it's just like Peyton thinks that like he would have stayed there um, yeah. with that first yeah, love? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I guess okay. yeah, is that he feels that way about all these other loves because he's been burned before. Yeah. Did you notice though that the um the mother of the soldier the second woman that he's with uh, and he kind of seduces her by using like the, the officer's uniform that he stole and he acts in kind of a way that um, the guy that he tried to duel that was marrying his cousin was acting. <laughs> no, I didn't pick up on that. Yeah. A lot of similarities in like their body language and um, the way he chooses to like woo her and stuff like that. Um, it's almost like the guy he chose to um, challenge to a duel. It's like, he realizes that that's like a, uh, a man with more status and a better man and, and saw how women just kind of respond to the uniform and like the, uh, the status in the world. And it's like, he used that status to kind of ingratiate himself in. And it's almost like yeah. he knew it would work, you know? Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And it, that makes sense. Yeah. And also Justin, I think, yeah, the relationship's definitely implied because when he leaves the, um, the narrator is like, he wasn't even the first one to like, storm her heart or something like that. He used like a war analogy for her heart. Like a yeah. storming the mm-hmm. storming the halls or something of her heart. I don't remember what it was. It was weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Could be more eloquently. Yeah. It definitely sounded we better would. in the movie. Okay. <laughs> so one scene I wanted to ask you guys opinion on is just really quickly. This is one of the scenes that I found to be really funny. And I'm just curious if you guys read it the same way, but the scene where Barry's going around looking at art, and he's he's like looking at the painting and he's like, well, how much is this one? And talking to him. But they're like, oh, yes, it's a it's a fine painting. And he's just like, I like the artist's use of the color blue. Like to me, that was a really, <laughs> really funny scene because like I, I've I felt like I was watching him be like completely like full of it and faking it till he makes it kind of. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And totally. I found I found a lot of humor in that sort of stuff uh, throughout the the film, but that that scene in particular was like hysterical to watch to me, and yeah. I want to make sure I'm not I'm not laughing inappropriately. Well, it's like um, it's not immediately funny because like it's my first time seeing it, so I wasn't really in that stage of like finding things humorous because I was still kind of watching it all unfold. But I definitely saw the decadence there, right? Like between the like. Like, it's almost like he cares about the status more than he cares about the actual art, right? Like, he doesn't care about art, probably. He's buying expensive paintings because he wants to, he always wanted to have a family fortune, and now he's got one he can squander, you know? Mm-hmm. So now it's time to buy paintings, and now it's time to buy ridiculous clothing. Like, I thought it was kind of humorous whenever they were showing him, like, all the different fashions of clothing. Right. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and it's just like he just wants to be fancy, you know. And he's not good at he's not good with money at all. He just like, oh, that I can buy it now because I've gotten myself into a situation to like completely screw over this rich family that I ingratiated myself into, whether they wanted me to or not, you know. So yeah, I agree. I mean, but then again, also on the flip side of that, we don't know anything about Barry Lyndon, so he may really, really love art. <laughs> That's true. The but narrator didn't tell us if he did or not. Hmm. Well, I think the one other thing that I think we should probably just mention is that this film won Academy Awards and like the things that it's praised for the cinematography, art direction, costume design, mm-hmm. and music. Everything you would think. Yeah. And it was also nominated for Best Picture and Best Director and Best Screenplay, but it did not win those. But it seems like it got the awards it deserved. So, what did it lose it to? Oh, that's a good question. Well, it wasn't like My Fair Lady or something. It was something weird it lost to, like terrible like that. No, it wasn't something terrible. It was One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Oh, okay, good. Ooh, so, stiff and was, competition. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's th- this year is tight. Like, I can see how Barry Lyndon would not beat really maybe any of these films. But so it was Barry Lyndon, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Dog Day Afternoon, Nashville, and Jaws. We're all. Oh, the, wow. The nominees. Yeah. Like, wow. I can see how Barry Lyndon would maybe even come in fifth in that lineup. Wow. Yeah, that is a good year. Yeah. <laughs> That's like 1999 or 2007 levels of good, if not better. Yeah. Well, better, really, probably. Yeah, definitely. All right. All right. Does anybody have anything else on Barry Lyndon? No, no. It's great. Yeah. You should watch it. Yeah, I'm glad I've finally seen it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad you've, you've seen it too. I have a few more Kubrick I need to see. Spartacus being one, Lolita and Killer's Kiss, I think, are the other two. So three I need to knock out to, to finish his filmography. All right. Well, maybe they'll release one in theaters soon. Maybe. Probably not. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. So are we ready to move into our choices for the next Criterion poll to choose our next Casually Criterion episode, which will be released two weeks from now? Yes. Yes. Awesome. So this week's theme is science fiction, and that's kind of based on the fact that we'll be reviewing a science fiction film in Ad Astra on next week's episode. So we're going to be choosing science fiction criterion films. So Peyton, as the guest of honor, Mm -hmm. you get to go first. What is your pick? Well, um, this is, uh, I was perusing my collection here of movies, looking over, uh, trying to come up with one. Uh, This is a recent release. It's a recent, recent addition to the criterion collection was 1984. Uh, which I absolutely adore. If you guys haven't seen it, it's amazing. I, I've seen it you know, probably half a dozen times, and uh, it's an adaptation of George Orwell's 1984, and it's a dystopian uh, film, and it is amazing. It was uh, shot by Roger Deakins, and um, it's amazing. So highly recommend it. Awesome. Nice. No, I have not seen this version of it, so this is great. I guess that means it's my turn. Sure, yeah, you go next. All right, so uh, science fiction, Criterion Collection. Uh, I had a couple on here. I think I'm going to go with the first film that I haven't seen, and that is a cult classic called Repo Man, starring Emilio Estevez. That was the one I was going to choose, so I'm going to pick another one while you talk about Repo Man. Nice. Well, uh, you better choose quick because I'm done, buddy. That's (laughs) all I really wanted to say, which is that I've always heard about it, cult classic. I don't really even know what it's about. But I want to see it. Yeah. That's where I'm at on it. I've never seen it, and that's why I was going to choose it. I hope that gave you adequate time. I tried to stall a little bit, adding some fluff in there. You did. So my choice is going to be a film I've been meaning to watch forever. I think I've actually owned it for like a year, maybe two. I just haven't watched it yet. And that is Terry Gilliam's Time Bandits. Ooh, very good. Yes. Which I've, I've started it once, so I do know what it's about. (laughs) <laughs> and it was enjoyable, but I think I got sleepy and just had to pause it, and I just never got back to it. Yeah, that's a Terry Gilliam problem I've run into before, too. He has a certain way about his movies that if you try to watch them when you're sleepy... No dice. Yeah, no no go. Yeah, so it appears to be about a kid who gets basically kidnapped by little people who are able to time travel, and they take him back through like times. Like in the, the first scene I watched, they were hanging out with Napoleon. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> so I don't know where it goes from there, but it was, it seemed like it could go like a really, really fun. And that's what I'm hoping for. No, it is. It's, uh, it's an utter delight. You'll love it. Yeah. Okay. It's one of the Terry Gilliam movies that I like more. Yeah, I, th- I think the first time I saw it, I was like seven or eight, and I it was like my favorite movie when I was a little kid. Yeah, I kind of wish I would have seen it when I was a kid because it does feel like I would have loved it. So we'll, I'm curious how I feel about it as like a 33 year old man watching it if it wins. That is. Yeah. By the way, just complete sidebar, real quick. Have you guys ever seen the movie Dark Crystal? Yes. When I was a kid, yeah. Okay. Apparently, Netflix uh, released like a new Dark Crystal series. With like puppets and everything like that, like the movie was originally filmed in. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. and apparently it's really, really good, like really good. Whoa. That's what I've been hearing. Yeah, and, and that they said the most impressive thing is that you know it was done with puppets. It's done on a on a, like a like a sound stage with sets, and it looks and feels like it like the movie didn't stop. Like it's like spot yeah. on. Yeah, I've never seen Dark Crystal, but I'm wondering if it's too late if I've missed the boat or if I can watch it now as a 32 year old man. <laughs> <laughs> and uh find only one way to find out really that's true <laughs> i better go right now cool all right so to recap the choices for the poll to choose our next casualty criterion episode are repo man 1984 and time bandits of course 1984 is peyton's choice peyton most likely will not be with us next episode as chris will have returned but you know still vote for it if you want i guess <laughs> thanks <laughs> yeah you're welcome all right so is that it for this episode i think so mike are you here i went to go watch dark crystal oh <laughs> <laughs> yes i'm here uh yeah that's it for this episode <laughs> good all right well thank you guys so much for listening of course thank you jake wagner russell for doing our intro and outro music if you want to hear more of his music you can do so at soundcloud.com slash bopscotch and then lastly and not least, Lee. Thank you, Peyton, for filling in for Chris and talking Barry London with us. Oh, I loved it. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Peyton. It was a blast. Thank you, listener. I hope you had a blast. Who am I kidding? Of course you did. Stay tuned to this feed. Next episode, we are going to be doing a review for Ad Astra, the new film from James Gray and Brad Pitt. All right, and once again, if you like the show, you want to follow us, you want to come vote in our poll, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Casual Cinecast. All right, once again, thank you guys so much for listening, and we will see you next time. Bye bye. Say goodbye, Peyton. Oh, sorry. Thanks for listening. There we go. <laughs> don't say thanks. Don't say thanks for listening because we said that like three hey. times already. That's oh, redundant. Did you? Okay. All right. All right. All right. Uh, I don't know. Toodaloo. Say that. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> say toodaloo. toodaloo. Yeah, I will. I will. Toodaloo. <laughs> don't, don't cut down that a bit, Justin. <laughs>